uh, who I have known, uh, we were trying to figure this out last night, I think for about 25 years. Um, David Lassner. David is the 15th president of the University of Hawaii system and is currently serving as interim cha chancellor of UH Manoa. He's worked at the university since 1977, holding the, the position of Vice President for Information Technology and Chief Information Officer for many years. David is also a member of the university's cooperating graduate faculty and has taught both online and in person in computer science, communications, business, and education. In prior positions, he played an active leadership role in a variety of local, national, and international information and communications technology organizations. He served on the boards of Hawaii's High Technology Development Corporation and Public Broadcasting Service Affiliate, and he chaired the state's broadband task force. David has also served on the board of Internet2 and was a co-founder and a board member of, Kuali, of the Kuali Foundation, um, a founding steering committee member and past chair of the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education, the Higher Education, which is Higher Education Cooperate, uh, Yes, Wichi um, and their their uh, uh, WCET Western or uh, Education Cooperation. Some, you know, it's odd. I, I actually ran the thing for a couple of years. <laughs> anyway, great organization, um, and uh, he's also the uh, past chair of the uh, uh, Pacific Telecommunications Council and Educause. Um, he's currently a WICHI commissioner, a board member for the National Association of System Heads, and uh, board of governors of the East-West Center. He also serves on the boards of uh, the Aloha United Way and the Blood Bank of Hawaii. Um, Dave's led Hawaii's major statewide federally funded projects that interconnected public schools, libraries, and campuses on six islands with fiber optics and is an active principal investigator with the National Science Foundation, from which he has received multiple grants over the past 20 years, focused on research and education network and, and cyber infrastructure. And he'll talk a little bit today about uh, a project that um, he has been uh, thinking about and working on uh, for the last uh, couple of decades, which is really uh, uh, coming to fruition now, uh, networking uh, the Pacific Islands. He's a, he was uh, and is the principal investigator for the Maui High Performance Computing Center and for the Pacific Disaster Center, um, uh, and their major Department of Defense programs on Maui. Uh, he earned an AB in economics, an MS in computer science uh, uh, at the University of Illinois, uh, Urbana-Champaign, and a PhD in communications and information sciences from the University of Hawaii. He's been recognized with uh, Internet 2's Richard Rose Award, WCET's Richard Johnson Award, and as a distinguished alumni of the University of Washington. Please uh, join me in welcoming David Lassner. Good morning. Ah, there we go. That was pretty painfully long. Uh, let's see how this works. We're on Plan C with AV this morning. Um, it's really a treat to be here. This is only my second Scenic conference, but Scenic and Pacific Wave are huge partners to everything that I'll be talking about this morning. Cool. I'm gonna hit it. Seven thousand years ago, the first really oceanic people came out of China and came out of Taiwan. Then you get to Polynesia, this oceanic country bounded by Hawaii in the north and New Zealand in the southwest and Rapa Nui in the east. Ten million square miles, bigger than Russia. And it was discovered by these extraordinary people. They were really the astronauts 
of our ancestors. They were the greatest explorers on the face of the earth. Unaided by modern instruments, these extraordinary explorers discovered and settled every livable landmass in the Pacific, relying solely on a complex understanding of the stars, the winds, the waves, and other cues from nature. Guided by this traditional wisdom and perspective, Hawaiians mastered the science of living sustainably on islands. Western expansion, however, brought not only new ways of seafaring, but a shift in perspective on how to interact with the natural environment. Eventually, traditional practices and worldviews were nearly forgotten. But a group of determined individuals got together in the 1970s to resurrect indigenous wisdom by building a traditional canoe and sailing it in the way of the ancestors. Hokulea's first voyage to Tahiti reawakened a cultural pride, identity, and an intimate connection to place. In a generation, Hokulea has sailed over 140,000 nautical miles to reunite the world's largest oceanic nation. Today, Hokulea voyages around the planet with the message of Malama Honua, or caring for island earth, with a firm belief that blending traditional and modern technologies will help us find our way to a healthier future. Hokulea, to us, to go around the world, has this enormous potential to go to 40, 50 countries on the planet, to be with the great navigators on Earth. And I'm not talking about those in canoes. I'm talking about those who are doing things to give kindness and compassion to the Earth and those who live on it, those navigators. We're not gonna change the world, but we're gonna go and build a network of people around the Earth who are gonna change it. And our job is to help them be successful. I wanted to start with that to give you a sense of what goes on in the Pacific and a melding, and I'll, I'll come back to this, of um, traditional knowledge, which often isn't appreciated, but becomes much more important when any of us are trying to work with cultures that are uh, substantially unlike our own. Um, you, I'm going to have a bunch of maps, but I thought I'd show this one. This is an amazing journey. Uh, this is the three-year voyage uh, that was mentioned. And so far, they have gone all the way from Hawaii down through Polynesia, New Zealand, Australia, to South Africa, where they met Desmond Tutu, over to um, South America, Brazil, up through the Caribbean, U.S. West Coast, East Coast, excuse me, through the Panama Canal, Galapagos, Rapa Nui, and right now they are between Rapa Nui and uh, French Polynesia, and will be home in January, a three-year voyage um, of a traditional canoe, uh, doing things that nobody had ever done before uh, with um, traditional knowledge. So I'm going to, this is a quick, I won't highlight um, everything on here, but the scenic uh, video talked about this a little bit, but it, without going too retrospective, Lewis warned not to do that. Um, higher education is really responsible for this thing that we call the internet. Uh, a lot of the research was funded by DOD, but it was smart university faculty who figured it out and uh, built those original connections. For us in Hawaii, um, we were in early, so in the, by the late 1980s, we had a project that was actually building some of the first uh, research network connections in the Asia-Pacific region, including the very first internet connection of any kind out of Australia, Japan, New Zealand, Korea. Um, we lost some of this with the commercialization of the internet, huge, huge success. And then it was in the mid-90s when organizations like Internet2 and Scenic began to recreate our essence as, as uh, research and education networks. 
um, and including connectivity internationally. So I'm going to show a couple of maps. This is the Internet 2 um, international partners. The dark countries are all places with whom Internet 2 has an MOA. And Anna is here. It's probably a little out of date. Sorry. Um, this is from APAN, the Asia Pacific Advanced Network. That's the multilateral collaboration among most of the Yarani networks in the Asia Pacific region. Um, and you can see where they, how they view the world um, from that side. And um, you'll note only two dots in the middle of the Pacific there. That's Hawaii. Here's another one. This is the famous glyph map. Thank you, Maxine. Uh, again, only two dots in the Pacific. Those are Hawaii. So I would argue, and my case for you today, is to think about the Pacific right now as the missing link. And we have colleagues here from other parts of the world, particularly um, Kenya is here. We welcome you. Um, a lot of work going on in these other parts of the world. Um, but there's really been nothing happening substantively on an organized fashion in the Pacific itself. This is what it looks like. So these are very small land masses with not very many people spread across a huge, huge geographic area. And um, with thanks to um, a study funded by the European Commission uh, to look at this issue, uh, you know, without going through it, this is a list of the territories and um, independent nations in the Pacific, small populations, um, and there's not very much higher education going on. Um, places that may or may not have a college, um, very few universities, and most of the universities, with just a few exceptions, are not the kind of universities that we think of in this country. Many of the colleges actually are closer to what we would think of as high schools um, with some vocational training programs. So it's, it's a very, very challenging situation um, again, highly distributed, uh, very weak economies, mostly subsistence with not much wealth. Where there is wealth, it's mostly coming in from somewhere in the developed world in, in some form of aid, uh, limited economic activity. And again, I bring you back to that uh, video I showed at the beginning. Um, in some cases, many of these islands have lost their way culturally and are suffering from not joining the new world but no longer having their old world, which was sustainable for quite some time. Uh, the largest incidence, incidences of non-communicable diseases, so diabetes, obesity, are huge problems in most of the Pacific. Um, these are economies that are just developing emerging re regulatory regimes. So many of them still have government-owned telcos that don't quite know what to make of competition or uh, are unable yet to deal with it effectively as most of the developed world has figured out or is figuring out. And um, it is not one region. So there isn't, for example, an ASEAN that brings together um, the Southeast Asian uh, uh, nations, uh, they get together in a couple of different forum, but in general, uh, they speak different languages. There are the French-affiliated Pacific Islands, the U.S.-affiliated Pacific Islands, those who have closer ties to New Zealand, and some that remain fiercely independent. So um, there's a lot of challenge to thinking of the Pacific uh, as a homogenous area. Um, and the development partners generally don't work together. Um, so if Australia launches an initiative or the U.S. launches an initiative, it may or may not be coordinated with the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank. Um, if it is coordinated, it's probably because somebody else involved uh, is coordinating below the surface, such as um, people in this room working together with RNET, Australia's r &E network, so that the work that they do in the Pacific is coordinated with work that we might be doing on the U.S. side in the Pacific. Um, and th this is the conundrum. Um, this is probably the hardest part of the world to network, and it's also the part of the world that needs it most to overcome the very issues created by um, their isolation and lack of resources. 
So there have been a few initiatives over the years. I want to highlight those. Uh, NSF funded a, um, an eager project, for those of you who know NSF speak, and that was a partnership between our university and um, NSRC. You'll be hearing from Steve Huter on the next panel, um, and they've been a great partner in development of R&E networking everywhere. In fact, um, they just received an award from Scenic. Uh, for their work. Um, the European Commission funded an, um, a CONNECT study as well. Um, Australia has been supporting uh, the University of the South Pacific. I'll show you a picture of what they're up to. And then I'll say a little bit more about our Pacific Islands r &E Network project, which is our current uh, International Research Network Connection project funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, in general, successes are pretty opportunistic. So when there, something happens, we grab the opportunity and we just go ahead and do it, but there isn't uh, or hasn't been a grand scheme for how we will network the Pacific. So these are the things I think you're all um, well aware of. This is what we do with our r and &E networks in whether it's California, nationally with Internet2, or the work we're doing in the state of Hawaii. Um, we drive toward a set of goals around research, education, and technology development. Um, and that's much of what um, we'll be talking about over the next few days. It looks a little bit different in the Pacific Islands where they don't have a robust research infrastructure. Big data is not uh, part of their jargon. Uh, they aren't using uh, high-performance computing advanced visualization just yet. So we've tried to think about what, what does r &E network actually mean in developing economies, in particular in the Pacific. So if you look at education and health, you can see a set of applications, and, and Lewis talked about this for Scenic, um, the importance of r &E networks reaching out to serve other communities, not just the top research universities in their region. Um, and we've been spending some time thinking about the connection of indigenous knowledge, um, again, highlighted by the uh, Hokulea video. Um, and I'll show you a little bit of how that comes into play with some of the work we've been doing in the Pacific. Um, access to information is huge. So these are places that don't have physical libraries of any consequence. And the opportunity to connect to the information resources that we make available, um, including about their cultures and histories, um, that's an immense opportunity for Pacific Islands. Um, and collaboration, as you can see. Uh, the, the problems that they face are immense besides health care, um, and again, a list of them. Many of them relate to the environment and sustainability. Uh, they have not yet gotten word in the Pacific that uh, climate change isn't happening. So from their perspective, um, if you're on an atoll with a maximum elevation of two feet, Sea level rise is very real as it begins to creep on their islands. And uh, many of these places, if, again, if it's a coral atoll, they are thinking about a future in which they will lose their homes. And what will they do about that? So it's very different than when we think about um, moving away from the seashore or building walls. Um, I want to emphasize this about research. Um, we have had a tradition uh, in most of the developed world, and there's a lot of great research that goes on in the Pacific Islands, but it's really important as we move forward to make sure we're engaged in this research with the Pacific Islanders, that it's not something we do to them, it's something we do with them. And in fact, um, what we're finding, and we have a major EPSCOR, those of you who are familiar with it, an NSF project, and we're trying to understand fresh water in Hawaii. That's one of our scarce resources. We know that there were probably 800,000 people living in Hawaii before Western contact, sustainability, sustainably. That population is now about 1.4 million. Um, so it isn't that much more people but we're sure struggling to understand how to live sustainably. And so we're trying to understand what did they know um, a thousand or so years ago, and they didn't really lose until perhaps 300 years ago. Um, what did they know that we have lost, and which pieces of that can we reintegrate 
into our worldview to improve our ability to live sustainable, sustainably today. And finally, let me mention the economic factors. Um, and I spend some time trying to talk telcos who charge essentially by the megabit for everything that leaves their island to explain to them why having idle capacity is useless, but if they make it available for R&E networking, it is in their economic best interest. And again, when you put in fiber, if you're not using all the capacity, it's close to free to activate it, but if they hoard it to create scarcity instead of sharing it with their education and research community, um, they're actually hurting themselves as well as their populations. So I think about it as workforce, that um, the only way people are going to learn how to work with this stuff is if they actually have access to it. Uh, I think about it as economic development in a global economy, and I think California is a great lesson for uh, the extent to which technology, uh, communications technology, has been one of the econ ec economic drivers for this um, $3.8 trillion economy, I just learned. Um, and then building market share, that people who have never experienced broadband don't even know what they are missing. Um, and, and we all experience this each time we continue to get leaps. We don't understand how we could have ever lived with dial-up modems. Um, and before that, um, we always had to go somewhere to actually use the Internet. We didn't understand what it would mean to be able to use it from anywhere via a modem. This is the level that most of these economies are at today. So it takes everybody, um, yeah, it takes a village, so to speak. So this is why I'm optimistic, is there is a huge amount of infrastructure development that has been going on um, over the past, in particular over the past decade. And I, I won't go through all of these. Um, on the left, you see the fiber projects that are uh, Pacific Islands focused. Um, the bold, so only in two cases do we currently have an educational entity uh, using that fiber for what we would call an R&E network. So um, it's a struggle. And in the other places, the barriers are policy, government, regulatory, commercial. They are no longer necessarily technical. Um, at the bottom on the left, you see some of the new regional fiber projects that are underway. Um, so we're trying to influence those directly as they come up to build in the opportunity um, for r and &E connectivity. This is not a hopeless task. I will say that um, a great example is Australia, the 100 gigabit uh, per second connections that connect our net, Australia's r and &E network, to uh, the U.S. via Hawaii. Uh, those are part of a special deal cut with the fiber provider that as they buy commercial access, they essentially get free circuits for r and &E connectivity. Um, so that's one model. Uh, in French Polynesia, uh, the telco, which is government uh, run, has just agreed to give one gigabit at no cost for their new r and &E network. Uh, they have direct fiber connectivity to Hawaii, so we have an opportunity there. Um, so we do have ways as we partner with them. Uh, it, it, has to be crafted as a win-win, uh, but that is absolutely not impossible, and we now have multiple models of how to make that happen. Um, South America, many of the early connections from Florida into South America were also crafted on these kinds of opportunities. Um, there are also some interesting satellite uh, projects, and one of the aspects of connecting the Pacific Islands uh, communities that's so challenging is if you think of Fiji, it's easy to think of it in one pla as one island, but in fact, even though Fiji is one of the best connected islands in the Pacific, the fiber goes to exactly one island and people live on 40 or more islands. So even if you get high-speed connectivity to Fiji, you haven't necessarily gotten it to all of the schools and libraries that serve the people of the nation of Fiji. I will mention a couple of those um, projects on the 
right at the bottom are interesting uh, because those are projects that are designed to connect major economies. So Australia, New Zealand to the U.S. typically, um, but with modern uh, submarine cable uh, fiber optic technology. Uh, so the one development of about, I guess, uh, the late 90s and the new systems that came up as of 2000 or so, they're all optically amplified. So you can change out the gear on the ends and increase the speed of the fiber systems from end to end subject to the ability um, uh, of the signal to propagate across the fiber through those optical amp amplifiers. Um, the other interesting capability that they figured out is how to put in optical branching units in the middle. So now one of the things they can do is drop optical branching units on these fiber systems as they are laying them in strategic locations so that later on, even if there isn't funding at the time, the big system is laid uh, on the ocean floor, you could pull it up and attach in a spur to a Pacific Island community later on when funding and need become more available. So we're seeing more and more of these optical branching units go into the modern systems if there's an interest by the project in serving Pacific Islands. So I mentioned the University of South Pacific in Fiji. Um, this is a really interesting institution, and it has been one of the leaders in r and &E networking uh, in the Pacific, and they've had to do this by satellite. It is actually a multilateral university. It is owned by 12 countries, uh, all of whom figured they probably didn't have the capacity, nearly all of whom figured they didn't have the capacity to create their own higher education institution. So they have collaborated to put this together. Um, it is headquartered in Fiji, but with campuses, as you can see in all of these other locations. So they put in a satellite system called USPNET um, probably 10 to 15 years ago. Um, very challenging to do the things we think of as very normal. Uh, sometimes they have double hops, so the latency is pretty severe for accessing things like a banner student information system or a Moodle online learning system. But those are the tools they need to use uh, to serve their highly distributed community just as we do. Um, they have been taking advantage of some of the new fiber projects. So what started as a satellite system now now, in Tonga, where they have a campus, and there is now fiber from Tonga to Fiji, they have moved their USP campus from satellite to fiber, and given the architecture of this particular satellite system, it actually has freed up capacity for the other, uh, you know, originally 11 uh, USP sites to have access to more satellite capacity. They've done the same thing in the Marshall Islands with their Marshall Islands campus, and they're along the way to doing this in Vanuatu, which also has fiber to Fiji now. So this is the project um, Lewis mentioned. It's my current one. This is the the third iteration of some version of an uh, IRNC project in the Pacific. Um, up to now, we've really focused on Australia, Hawaii, to um, the US, uh, funded by NSF. In fact, the, I first got involved in this project when John Sylvester was the principal investigator on an IRNC project, and we began to work on um, how we would reach out to Australia. Um, if you're wondering how it is that Hawaii gets to participate in an international research networking uh, project, one of the um, elements of this that we talk about is international science. And we happen to host in Hawaii on some of our mountaintops um, the major international uh, astronomical observatories that really serve much of the world. So the data generated in Hawaii has an international constituency that is served through this project as well. Um, you can see what we're up to. Our big deal is the, um, the Australia connection. And, and I, I want to um, thank, I guess this is a good time to thank once again, uh, Pacific Wave and Scenic has been amazing partners. We could not do what we do without what Scenic and Pacific Wave do uh, to support those connections, all of which come in on the west coast of the U.S. So this is, um, this is our, our big network piece. So... Uh, however many months ago that is, less than a year ago, we upgraded these two circuits from Australia to the U.S. via Hawaii to 100 gigabits per second. These are 100% dedicated to research and education networking. 
Um, this was our celebration. Anybody here from Berkeley? So this is the celebration at the University of Hawaii Berkeley football game in Sydney. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, well, good job, you other guys. We did not prevail. Um, our project also engages in collaboration with the other INC partners. I already mentioned NSRC, Pacific Wave. This is some work we're doing um, with Indiana University around network monitoring. Uh, Jen will be up on the next panel as well so that we can all instrument our IRNC links and look at them as a coherent whole. Um, and then we've been doing a lot of work thinking about the Pacific architecture. And we... Um, just about a year, a year ago, January, January 2016, we got this idea to convene a meeting uh, in Hawaii in January, never a bad idea, I have to say, um, to pull together people who are doing r and &E networking, very focused on the Pacific and Trans-Pacific. And we're looking at both big connections and Pacific Islands, which tend not to be big connections, with a couple of exceptions. Um, and I started drawing this picture. You can see it's kind of a scrawl. I'm not very good with my, um, well, I'll leave it at that. Um, but what we noticed is that when you overlay where the fiber actually goes, which of course is not developed for R&E, it's developed for the commercial market, you notice that there are two hubs in the Pacific. Those are really Hawaii and Guam. And in fact, Guam is doing great. We've got two folks here from Guam, John Peterson and uh, Romel Hidalgo, formerly of CSU and CNIC, in fact. Um, and so we started thinking about how we would connect Pacific Islands primarily via these two locations, I'm sorry, as well as Fiji, which is a hub for Southern Cross and is therefore one of the reasons that um, so many of the islands I mentioned, Tonga, Vanuatu, are pulling fiber to Fiji to jump on to the big system, uh, the Southern Cross Cable Network. So we started thinking about what this might look like. Um, and this one is a picture a little bit later on looking at the high-speed links. So the model has essentially been somebody with funding for a high-speed link buys it from where they are to where they want to get to. And we started thinking about how, if we organized ourselves a little bit better, um, we might create an architecture which would be far more functional and far more resilient. So if we get the right links in, in place, and these, pretty much this one only shows um, links that are of roughly 100 gigabit speeds or higher, you can start to see how working together with Singapore, potentially Hong Kong, um, Guam, Hawaii, Australia, New Zealand, we can actually create a pretty resilient um, architecture. A big part of this has been an initiative to create an open R&E exchange in Guam. Um, that has been a collaboration with uh, Australia, um, Pacific Wave again, University of Hawaii, and the University of Guam um, is our local hands-on partner on site. Um, the University of Hawaii actually bought a new 100 gigabit per second circuit with state funds uh, from Hawaii to the U.S. West Coast. And here's an example where we got them to throw in 100 gigabits on the Hawaii-Guam leg at no additional cost, which then we're able to use to dedicate to R&E networking and to make this exchange concept real. This is a blow up um, of the fiber optic landing stations in Guam. Um, while there is a ton of fiber that comes in, uh, both from big, big fiber systems and small fiber systems, it's the regional hub for the Northern Marianas, will be for Palau, Yap, um, uh, Federated States of Micronesia, Marshall Islands. It's also a stopping point for uh, many of the new systems coming across from Southeast Asia and then new routes uh, from Japan, Guam to Australia that create great opportunities for resilience. Our colleague Jun Murai from Japan, who some of you know, often overlays existing fiber with the ring of fire showing where earthquakes uh, occur. And um, our current International fiber infrastructure is incredibly vulnerable to um, earthquakes and I'll just say other disruptions in the South China Sea. 
And this is, um, so the reason these maps are pretty, they don't look like mine, is uh, this is the good work of Scenic and Pacific Wave starting to take these concepts and turn them into something that's actually presentable. Um, this attempts to overlay both the big links with the small links and that sort of incremental hybrid RNE network. And this is something I want to emphasize that it looks like if we can make all this real, that the very availability of the ultra high speed links across through Guam and Hawaii and Fiji create the opportunity for mini RNE hubs that then can serve the small Pacific islands for whom 100 gigabits or even one gigabit is a pipe dream. So I hope I'm not stealing Steve's uh, thunder, but much of this is about human capacity, just as is this conference. Um, so kudos to NSRC. Um, this is a workshop at the University of Guam last year that also pulled in um, network engineers from neighboring islands and other educational institutions on Guam, and we also had engineers participating. Um, they do amazing work at helping bring the network technologies that engineers in emerging economies need in order to be able to participate in our global R&E fabric. Um, this is another area that we're working. I mentioned the availability of fiber to French Polynesia. This one is interesting. We now have the commitment of a gigabit of capacity at no cost between French Polynesia and Hawaii. Um, we have to figure out what to do in French Polynesia, and we're back into uh, politics, regulation, and economics. Um, this is interesting because it's very multinational in interest. So again, for those of you from Berkeley, you have an outstanding marine biology research station called the Gump Station on Morea. Uh, they do incredible work, and they live off of the end of multiple DSL connections into French Polynesia's commercial internet service from the telco. Um, so that's something we want to fix. The university there is funded by France. This is a, you know, French Polynesia, French, get it? Um, they have a 10 megabit connection directly to Paris. Rather than using the direct fiber to Hawaii that could connect them into Renatair and France at literally 100 gigabits unconstrained from Hawaii across to France, across our global r and &E fabric. So this is the kind of thing we're trying to work on with French Polynesia. Um, France also has its research stations, uh, both for marine biology, health, and other services, just as for the US, um, we have the GUM station, which is an NSF-funded uh, long-term ecological research station. So, oh, sorry about that. I'll just put them all up. So we do pretty well. I'm not really doing a talk about um, Hawaii. Um, we have benefited from many, many opportunities. We were an early fiber hub and jumped on that opportunity beginning with that PACOM project or PACOM project that I mentioned. Um, we're on our third round of IRNC. We understand how to write NSF. CC star now grants and so we've built our science DMZ with great NSF support we have built Marla Meal's favorite project with CC star support I'll have a picture up for her um, we've also been supporting utilization in partnership with many others around the country to build human capacity in cyber infrastructure enabled research um, this has been huge for us these are opportunities that are not available if you're sitting in the middle of the Pacific um, and you're not able to access US-related funding. I will say that the um, uh, President Obama Stimulus Act was huge for us. It was um, just an amazing opportunity, and I've just highlighted three of the grants there. Um, we're in EBSCOR state, which is wonderful. We're working with Guam to bring them into the EBSCOR family, and John Peterson, who's here, is, um, I believe, their lead on this. Um, but that uh, provides opportunities for developing research infrastructure. And for us, we've tried to focus on our cyber infrastructure as part of that uh, research infrastructure for Hawaii. Um, we were able to acquire two 10 gig circuits when those were fast, um, not very long ago. Um, those both come into the West Coast, again, both into Pacific Wave from Hawaii. 
Um, and for us internally, we got a very large, for us, um, NTIA BTOP, Broadband Technology Opportunity Program grant. And so we use that to extend fiber um, that we essentially manage one way or another on terrestrial fiber. We actually light it ourselves. On the submarine segments, we now have access to wavelengths. So we put the signal onto the wavelengths that are provided by the carrier. Um, as a result of this project, we now have fiber to every public higher education site, including community colleges, which are part of our system. Every public school, this is on six islands, every public library. We think we're the first state to do this. Last month, Hawaii was rated as um, our K-12 education system as the best connected K-12 system in the country with fiber at at least gigabit speed plus a Wi-Fi connection on every public school campus in the state. And we've also worked with DRAN, uh, U.S. Naval Observatory pulled fiber up at the top of Mauna Kea for a telescope they cared about. Um, NOAA have all been very good partners with us to achieve science mission. It's a small state, so it does make it easier to collaborate. So let me um, close by saying a little bit about what we're doing with it. This is um, Mauna Kea. This represents over a billion dollars worth of telescope investment from about 12 different countries, um, all of whom, I think most of you know this, modern astronomy, you don't put your eye up to a telescope or anything. It's all um, generating data. So we just, we have to watch the data flows. Um, people often, it's still 10 gigabit connections, and when people ask, when's it going to be 100, our answer is, and again, we can light the fiber at higher speeds, but why pay for that before the demand calls for it? That's the only reason we haven't driven that up to 100. Um, so this is a huge resource for our state and for the world. Uh, on Haleakala on Maui, um, we have the Daniel K. Noe Solar Telescope. Uh, this is funded by NSF, the most advanced solar telescope in the world. This will see first light. Current plan is 2019. Construction, external construction is now completed. Marla's favorite project, Mauna Loa. Um, we're finally getting it well connected um, for a variety of things for people other than um, who don't work up there, this is most known as the source of the Keeling Curve. This is the place where we have, uh, mankind has monitored carbon dioxide in the atmosphere longer than any other place on Earth on a continuous basis. Um, for the Australians, the Square Kilometer Array is their premier big science project at which they will play a major international role as a data source in addition to consumer. This will be the uh, most powerful radio telescope in the world distributed across uh, two major locations at least. South Africa is the other one. This is some of what we're doing in Hawaii. This is, um, we call our version, uh, the Cyber Canoe. It used to be OptiPortal. Um, so apologies, Jeff, but uh, Jason Lee, who uh, we lured away from University of Illinois, Chicago, um, he says this is 1.6 times more resolution than uh, your display. So, um, but it gives you something to strive for. But you can't see it all at once. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let, I'll let you duke it out with him. <laughs> um, but again, so the question is, what are we doing with it? Um, so we've started engaging with our partners in Asia and the Pacific. Um, this is actually the visitors. Um, we brought our uh, Asia Pacific networking group there, and we set up workshops in Japan. And then we hosted them in Jason's Lava Lab. He's really good with acronyms, by the way. Cyber Canoe stands for something. Lava Lab stands for something. Uh, the V is visualization. Um, and these are the application areas that we're looking at international collaborations using um, advanced visualization and big data. Um, this is one of our projects, and uh, now I'll push out into the Pacific a little more. This one is with um, um, Christmas Island, Kiribati, um, and uh, Samoa. We're not supposed to say Western Samoa anymore. It's just Samoa. Here's some work we're doing with the Marshall Islands. Um, this is through our PAC IOS, those of you who are following the national and global uh, international observing uh, ocean observing systems. Um, we're the hub for most of that going on in the Pacific. 
Um, again, you can see this becomes really important to people in island communities who face the challenges associated with climate change far more, um, far more, far, far more seriously than many of us do in the U.S. Um, here's some outreach we're doing with American Samoa. That's Sylvia Earle in the middle, who's one of the world's foremost um, scientists. Uh, early, um, well, leave it at that. Work we're doing in Federated States of Micronesia. In some cases, this is not yet empowered by high-speed networking. This is the work we're doing that would be better enabled by high-speed networking. This is a um, super cool project around coral reefs. Um, this is funded by the Paul Allen um, Ocean Challenge. And so we're doing, um, we're calling it assisted evolution. So trying to accelerate processes uh, naturally occurring evolutionary processes to help coral, and probably most of you will have seen the news last week that the um, Great Barrier Reef is far more dead than we had thought. Um, so this is a collaborative project between um, our Hawaii Institute of Marine Biology and the Aussies to try to understand if we can help coral evolve to be able to survive the conditions to which we are subjecting it. Um, very exciting. Um, this gets us a little bit closer into culture, but we've been restoring fish ponds in Hawaii. This was one of the sources of sustainable food in Hawaii that I mentioned. Um, the Hawaiians figured out aquaculture um, very early on and built these fish ponds, most of which have got, fallen into disrepair. So we have been restoring them in Hawaii. They turned it out to be a great form of hands-on learning to get kids interested in STEM who would never have had any interest in taking a science class. But if you start to talk with them about sustainability and the practices of their ancestors and they get to get wet and muddy, it creates a different kind of opportunity for them to get inspired by science and sustainability. Um, and this is something we're doing with New Zealand, which does have a, a really great research network. And so let me close um, with that. This is, um, again, the Hokulea, quite a juxtaposition. I mentioned that it um, went up the U.S. West Coast. Um, I have bought into this belief that we need to knit together culture and science to move forward. I actually spent three weeks last summer as a crew member on this segment of the voyage, and you can't see me, but I was actually on the com canoe as it came into New York Harbor. And for me personally, um, it brought, um, in an area in which immigration is a source of such conversation and controversy, my grandparents came in, not from the Pacific, but from um, Eastern Europe, came in through New York Harbor um, about 115 years ago. And so it was pretty cool for me to get to do it on a Hawaiian voyaging canoe uh, last summer with a group of Hawaiians who are rediscovering their heritage as well. So um, thank you very much. I think I'm probably gone on long enough that we should stop, and, uh, but I'll take questions during a break. Does that make sense? Okay, thank you.